Good morning. <clears throat> good morning. Yeah, I lost my voice there, I think. <clears throat> good morning. It's good to be with you today. Welcome to the Lord's house. I'll, I'll tell you, you know, it's been a, uh, a challenging time lately. As I, I said, I had both of the uh, Moderna vaccines, and uh, you know, I guess a few weeks since I had the second shot. Ended up being really sick for uh, a day and a half or so, and then uh, Friday morning I woke up and had a terrible stomach ache, and by midday I had trouble walking. It felt like my legs were a thousand pounds, and then my head, and then I started running a temperature, and I thought, oh, this is not good. And so I thought, well, I'm going to be calling one of the other pastors if I'm still feeling you know, bad on Saturday. I woke up yesterday, <clears throat> and I, I feel fine, so <clears throat> I'm not sure. <clears throat> I do know that we're hypersensitive, though, you know, if... Uh, we don't feel well. We think COVID right away with everything, but I've been tested uh, before and then before I had the vaccine and everything was negative. So um, <clears throat> just don't know, but continue to pray for those that are battling with, with COVID. Uh, I know uh, we received word that Amy Willever uh, has COVID and uh, is being isolated at home. So I want to pray for her. I, I hear Cindy uh, Kern is doing better. Uh, and uh, I, I know she's eager to get back to her normal routine. Uh, she, I, they must have to tie her down. I know it must be difficult uh, for Cindy because she really likes to keep active. And so, um, and I heard that uh, Martin Redkay is coming home tomorrow. So praise God. Uh, God is bringing healing among us, and God is good. Uh, we just need to continue to pray that, that God is going to bring healing to the world, and he is. Uh, he's given us everything we need each and every day through Christ Jesus. Uh, we just need to continue to trust him by faith. Um, <clears throat> there's a promise of warmer weather this week. I, I don't know how I'm going to act. I've been so cold taking Sandy out walking, and she doesn't seem to be in any hurry to get back in. Uh, she takes her good old time, and uh, you know, it doesn't matter how cold it is or how windy it is. She seems to be fine. But uh, warm weather, I hear maybe 50 or 60 degrees this week. I don't know. Um, also want to pray for Emerald Wall, who's going in for a procedure on the 10th, and uh, pray for, uh, for Keith and Pauline, grandma and grandpa, as they worry over their granddaughter. And we, uh, we trust that God, uh, truly the great physician, brings the healing that we need. And so you have that and any, many other things on your, your prayer list. Uh, if there is something that you would like us to pray for, uh, by all means, you can shoot me an email, give me a call, send me a text, whatever works easier for you, hand me a note, and uh, we'll make sure that we can include that on the prayer list. <clears throat> Excuse me, on Wednesdays, we're still having our Lenten services at 7 p.m. Uh, this week is going to be from Deuteronomy 4, 1 through 9, Lord, teach me to obey. Um, and on Thursday at 7 p.m., we're going to have a uh, Sunday school board meeting. Is that going to be virtual or is that going to be live? And when you figure it out, let me know and I'll let everybody else know. All right. Uh, next Sunday, we are going to spring forward. So that hour that you gained back in October, you're going to give it back. And uh, so you... You want to make sure you do that on Saturday evening. Uh, the altar flowers are presented to the glory of God in memory of uh, Marion and Joseph Ruth by Rosalie and Martin Redkay and family. Uh, the bulletins presented the glory of God in honor of Doug and Marcia Sewell, and thanks for all they do for Zion. I, I've greatly appreciated you guys leading the worship, and uh, you truly have been my George Beverly Shea, and uh, have done a marvelous job along with, uh, with Carol and with Keith and others that have made these services possible when we haven't been able to meet in person. And even now, we're, we're touching lives uh, in, in, in many ways. And so I praise God for, for everyone who lends their time and talent in service to the Lord. Uh, there's a list in there for pantry needs uh, for the month. Uh, there's also a self-denial offering that we'll be taking uh, during munch. Uh, yeah, munch. Lunch must be on my mind. I don't know. Dur during March, John, I might need to call you up here in a moment. <laughs> during March, there's a special envelope that you can use. Uh, you, there's an insert for uh, Easter lilies. Uh, the cost is $10, and you have until the 28th of March to... Uh, to purchase a lily or two in memory or in celebration. Uh, there's also the CPYU parent page uh, for March, which is great information for uh, the things that impact the children and youth today. So by all means, you want to, to look those things over. Uh, with that, um, our call to worship uh, is adapted from Psalm 51. 
Have mercy on us, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out our transgressions. Against you, you only, have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Let us hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Do not cast us from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from us. Let us pray. Father God, we, uh, we come this morning into your sanctuary. We ask that you would just fill it with your Holy Spirit's presence. That as we worship today, that we would indeed have that extra measure of your presence, that you would help us to uh, just put away any distractions, that we might focus on your presence among us as the, the word is read, as the message is given, as the, the songs are sung, as the fellowship takes place. And through it all, Father, may we be reminded of your amazing love and grace for us that is ours in Christ Jesus. It's in his precious name that we pray. Amen. Our uh, opening hymn today is, O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Please stand and join me. to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. Jesus, the name that charms our fears and bids our sorrows cease, tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. The power of cancelled sin, he sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the valleys clean, his blood availed for me. Hear him, ye deaf, his praise ye dumb, your listening tongues employ. Be blind, behold, your Savior come. And leap ye lame for joy. My gracious Master and my God, Assist me to proclaim, To spread through all the earth abroad, The honors of thy name. Amen. You may be seated. With a great appreciation, again, for everyone that uh, supports the ministries at Zion, we are truly grateful. You know, it's our desire to be a lighthouse of hope for this community and the communities we serve and a sanctuary of growth for all who enter in and all that connect with us you know, by the, the way of um, streaming services and through, through other ways. I am just so grateful uh, that, that God is working among us and even in a very difficult environment, uh, we are seeing people come to the Lord as their Savior. We're seeing people finding healness and wholeness and help, uh, healing and wholeness and help in, in a difficult time. And, and God is good. And I know no matter what, um, he is with us every step of the way. Let us pray. Father God, we uh, come together today. We, we thank you. We thank you for tithes and offerings and time and talent and uh, we thank you for willing hearts and lives that, that show up and, and, and supply all that is needed to, to reach men and women, boys and girls with the love, the grace, and the provision of Christ Jesus. We, we thank you, Father, that we can uh, continue to share your story, uh, your holy word, a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path, to a world that is hurting, to a people in desperate need of a Savior. It's in our Savior's precious name we pray. Amen.
praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated. So I said, you know, you have each week in your, your bulletin a prayer and praise uh, list. Uh, we also have scripture readings uh, for each day of the week. Uh, it's a great way to, to stay in the word and to stay connected with all that, that God has for you in his word. Um, you know, we, we need to continue to pray, uh, not only for the people on the list, but pray for our world, uh, pray for this country. Uh, you know, we're just um, we're really backward and, and, and losing ground, you know, when now Dr. Seuss is bad and Mr. Potato Head is no longer politically correct, evidently. I, Rachel Levine's okay, though. I, I just don't get it. I, I, and I'm not to malign any person, but what's really happening here, you need to understand is this country is seeking to quiet the church. They want to silence the word of God. They do not want us to believe what we believe. They, they want us not to believe what is morally right and good and acceptable in the sight of God. They want us to embrace the very thing that God calls sin. I'm not maligning any particular person. You know, everyone is free to make their own choices. You're not free from the consequences of your choices. And it's but by the grace of God any of us go. But when the government starts getting involved and, and talking about legislating things, which may have a, a major impact on the church, uh, we need to really pray because we have gone far, far south. Uh, we no longer have a moral compass that is guiding us as a country. And, and that's sad. I, I just I can't believe some of the things they keep coming up with that uh, they're saying are not acceptable. Um, and yet they're throwing so many other things at us that the Bible says are not acceptable. Let's pray. Father God, we come together today. And we, we ask that your hand of healing and blessing and protection and provision would be upon your world, especially for this country, our, our leaders locally and uh, nationally. We pray, Father, that they would seek wisdom from you as they legislate things that would uh, be for the good of the people, for all people. It's not our job to malign anyone or to harm anyone or to, to hate anyone. But in the same sense, Father, we want to do the things that are pleasing in your sight. Help us to that endeavor, we pray, for the world that we live in, a world that is spiraling further and further out of control, lost in sin. I pray, Father, for those that need your hand of healing, truly each and every one of us. May you meet our needs, and may you uh, continue to uh, work in us that which is pleasing in your sight. Bring healing and hope and wholeness into our lives. We pray, Father, for our uh, men and women that are serving this country, that you would protect them and provide for them. We, we pray, Father, that you would be with us. Um, our uh, shut-ins and those that aren't able to be here physically today, that you would provide for them, that they would know that they are loved and valued. And we pray, Father, for our missionaries and the missions that we serve throughout the world, that you would uh, give them all that is theirs in Christ. We, we do pray, Father, that you would uh, help us to uh, be all that we can be in Christ. Give us clean hands and pure hearts as we seek to serve you by faith that we will strive to help the needy, the helpless, the hurting, the lost, and those that mourn, that they might find healing and wholeness in your presence. And let us pray as Jesus taught the disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I don't know. I, I just keep getting more and more frustrated lately with uh, the things that keep coming my way via news and social media and the things that 
that they're saying are no longer acceptable. Uh, I, I just, I, I just don't understand it. I, uh, and, and yet they're, they're holding up other things that God calls sin and says this is acceptable. I, I just, I'm beside myself with this. I, uh, I know that we're to love all people, and that's our goal as a church, to love everyone and to, to, to give them Jesus. But I, I think it's also our role as the church to stand for the truth of God. We stand for the word of God. And, you know, there are people in the world that don't want to hear the word of God today. They don't want to hear about Jesus. And that's their right. But don't take away my right to proclaim Jesus as Savior and Lord to a lost and hurting and sinful world. Amen. <clears throat> Our uh, praise hymn today is the solid rock. Amen. Our message uh, today, uh, based on our lectionary reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 13 to 22, is entitled, When Jesus Cleans House. Uh, and we, we need to clean house from time to time, don't we? I, I'm painfully aware that I need to spend some quality time in the attic and in the basement. And yeah, you know, it, it's just, uh, I, I need to straighten out the attic so I can put more stuff up there and not have to, to fall over things. I know you guys don't have these problems at home. And, 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 and the thing with the attic, though, it's really tricky. You see, you got to do it in the fall or the spring because the winter and the summer, you're either going to freeze or you're going to burn. So you got to get it out of the way during the, the good times of the season. The basement is kind of okay year-round, but I don't understand it. We don't have any kids anymore, and it just seems to happen that things need to be tidied and they need to be straightened out and, and some things need to be discarded and thrown away. And as I, I think about, you know, cleaning house, you know, we need the dust from time to time. If we don't, it, it just seems to accumulate. Of course, they, they say the Pennsylvania uh, uh, Dutch cure for dust is just to close the window blinds and, and that way the sun doesn't make it apparent. And, and so... I didn't say that. I'm just quoting somebody that said that. So don't, I'm just the messenger. Don't, don't, don't shoot the messenger. But, you know, as I think about the world that we live in today, when Jesus cleans house, what does he want to clean in our hearts? 
and in our lives and in our world. And what would he say today if he was here? Things that harm his heart because we're not living and doing and being the people that he calls us to be in Christ. Could I have somebody offer a prayer for the message today, please? Amen. Thank you, Carol. I appreciate that. So this is our reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 2. Jesus is is, is slowly but surely uh, working his way to the cross. Uh, We know that he's going to spend a few days in Capernaum uh, with his mother and his siblings and the disciples, and then they would travel to uh, Jerusalem for the Passover feast says, it was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. And Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and cattle. He scattered the money changers' coins over the floor and turned over their tables. And then going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from the scriptures, passion for God's house will consume me. But the Jewish leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. What? Uh, It says, all right, Jesus replied, destroy this temple in three days, I will rise it up. He says, what they exclaimed, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you can rebuild it in three days. But when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this. And they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. Here's the reality. This temple that they have been building for 46 years uh, wouldn't be completed until A.D. 64. So they still had a ways to go. It wasn't even complete at that point. And they're asking for a sign. You know, they're not having the temple guard arrest Jesus. They're, They're saying, okay, if you're doing this, then show us a sign. Now, he's already shown them many signs and wonders along the way. Uh, They're not without information. What they're without is faith that Jesus is the Messiah. Malachi said the Messiah would come and cleanse the temple. Well, the Messiah is here, and he is going to give them a sign. And after the resurrection, they still will not believe because their hearts are hardened. They refuse to believe the reality that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And even the disciples wouldn't fully get it until after the resurrection, but they believed. They had faith. You know, it's amazing that they just didn't understand. They just refused to understand. And the the bottom line is, is that their hearts were hardened And what they were doing was truly repulsive to God. Here's the thing. According to the law of Moses, all Jewish males 19 and over needed to go to Jerusalem for the three major feasts, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Pentecost was by far the most uh, attended festival of the year. As a matter of fact, Jerusalem would swell to Uh, probably 2 million plus additional people for Pentecost. And so if you were 19 years or older, you needed to make that pilgrimage. And this came at great hardship for for many poor people that would have to travel a distance to get there. So at some point, the Talmud was changed to say, okay, if you lived 15 miles away or a day's journey, you were still required to come to the temple for these three major feasts. And the Passover by far was the biggest feast that had a very rich meaning where they were delivered out of the hands of their oppressors. 
and uh, this celebration that God passed over and spared them. And uh, not only were they there for this Passover celebration, they were also there to pay the annual temple tax. And so if you were 19 years of age or older, you had to pay a temple tax, which was a half shekel. And a half shekel, uh, in, in there, it was a measure of weight. It was also a coin. It could be gold. It could be silver. Uh, and it, it, it was probably worth about two days' worth of wages, maybe by today's money, maybe $5. And, and so they, they had to pay this temple tax. And every Jewish male, 19 or over, was required to make this pilgrimage and, uh, you know, this was a, a difficult thing for some people. You know, they, you know, I often marvel at people that drive an hour or 45 minutes to come here and worship with us. I'm amazed, but I, I have to remind myself, they've got vehicles. You know, they can drive cars, and, and cars can get us from point A to point B without too many problems. But if you're traveling, you know, even 15 miles, you know, can you, can you see grandma and grandpa, you know, traveling with the family, you know, for 15 miles, a day's journey, and, and getting there, and, and when they get there, they're faced with uh, wanting to be able to offer a sacrifice. They, they, they want to be able to pray and, and worship, and they want to be able to pay their temple tax. And, and I, I think about the people in, in Jerusalem must have loved these major feasts because it was great. It, it meant that they could make money. You know, I think about where I lived in Ohio. I lived on a street that connected with one of the entrances to uh, the Firestone Country Club where they play the Bridgestone Invitational every year. And uh, it is just truly amazing that people on my street lived for that week because they could park people on their lawns, sell hot dogs and hamburgers, and they could charge people 10 and $20 to park on their lawn so that they could have easy access into the... Uh, the, uh, the tournament. And so they just live for that. And, 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 and so as we think about this, this gathering for this feast and these two million plus people that are in town for this, and they're there to pay their annual temple tax, uh, which is a half shekel. But here's the, here's the thing. They, uh, they, they couldn't pay the temple tax with their own currency. You know, they're coming from different lands, so they have different currency. So they had to exchange their currency either for a Galilean half shekel or for a temple half shekel, a sanctuary shekel. Uh, and so in order to, to exchange their currency for the shekel to pay their annual temple tax, they paid exorbitant rates to exchange their money. You know, I, I was often amazed, you know, when I would go to the, uh, the Bridgestone Invitational, um, they wouldn't let me bring my bottle of water in, but I could buy one for 6 or $7 while I was in there. And uh, you, know, you get it. So they're really gouging people and taking advantage of them. So in this temple area, you know, Jesus saw merchants. They're selling cattle and sheep and doves for sacrifices. And he sees these dealers at tables that are exchanging the money for the people so that they can pay the temple tax. And, and these are in many cases, poor people. And barely can they afford to pay this, and yet they have to pay an exorbitant rate to get the right exchange to be able to pay this annual tax. In addition to the temple tax, the people had to offer a sacrifice. Sacrifice had to be a one-year-old male, sheep or goat, that was without blemish or defect. Now, if you're traveling a day's journey or longer, it's kind of cumbersome to, to, to bring, you know, sheep and goats along with you. And uh, you could probably go into town and, you know, from Levi, if he had a sacrificial uh, lamb or goat to sell, and he'd probably sell you one at a, a reasonable cost. <clears throat> but when you got to the temple with your own offering, you'd have to pay a fee to have it inspected. And the chances of it being inspected and found worthy of a sacrifice were not good because they wanted you to buy the sacrifice from them. This is all taking place in the temple court, the outer part of the, the temple. Uh, and um, I can't even begin to imagine what this must have been like. So they would have to pay an exorbitant rate to buy their sacrifice. And uh, the money exchangers and the people that are, are selling these uh, sacrifices 
the sacrificial animals are, are getting rich, you know, 100, 200% above the, the real cost. Not only were they getting rich, but the, the priesthood was getting rich. They were making money off of the people because the people had to be there. Here's the other thing about this that's really, really an eye-opener. Uh, there were Gentile believers that came to Jerusalem for the Pentecost, and they were only allowed in the outer courts to pray. They weren't allowed in the temple anywhere. And so, have you ever been in a barn? Country fair? Animals are loud? Smelly? I'm just trying to think how conducive this must be for worshiping and praying. All the cacophony of, of noise and sense and just terrible things going on, and yet I'm supposed to be prayerful. It's no wonder Jesus is, is irate about this. You know, the temple was open year-round, and people were there, but it was only during these high holidays that they, they jacked the prices up because they knew that people had to, to, to be there for special things. Uh, throughout the year, it wasn't bad from what I've read, but uh, during these special times, especially during uh, the Passover, people were, were really being taken advantage of. It says, and his disciples remembered this prophecy from Scripture's passion for God's house will consume me. And Jesus is seeing what's happening in God's house, and he is truly upset to the point of driving them out and turning over the tables and, 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 and just, you know, saying, you guys are just truly desecrating and making a mockery of my father's house. In Isaiah 56 and 7, uh, he says, I will bring them to my holy mountain of Jerusalem and will fill them with joy in my house of prayer. I will accept their burnt offerings and sacrifices because my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. You know, all of the, uh, the Gospels uh, have an account of Jesus cleansing the, the temple. John gives us some details that the other Gospels don't. <clears throat> but in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verses 45 and 46, it says, And Jesus entered the temple, and he began to drive out the people selling animals for sacrifices. He said to them, The Scriptures declare, My temple will be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. So Jesus takes a rope, and he makes a whip from some ropes, and he chases them all out of the temple. I would have loved to have been there to see that. This is actually the second time that Jesus clears the temple. And he drives out the sheep and the cattle, and he scatters the money changers, coins all over the floor, and he turns over their tables, and then going over to the people who sold the doves, he told them, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Here's the thing, if you go back to, to 1 Kings and you read about Solomon and building the first temple and, and dedicating the temple to God and the Ark of the Covenant is in the Holy of Holies, the most center part of the temple and God's presence just fills the sanctuary and people, people are in awe and deep reverence and respect and love for God. And somewhere along the line, the religious leaders lost that. They began to no longer see God's presence, but they seen their own desires. They, they allowed their hearts to become hardened. They, they allowed to, to become greedy. You know, it was said that the, uh, the temple was robbed in, uh, I think, A.D. 56, and, and the robbers took, uh, probably by today's money, about $10 million dollars. And uh, the truth is there were still vast amounts of money in their, their collection of money that they have taken from people that oftentimes could not afford. You know, in Leviticus 10, 10 and 11, it says, you must distinguish between what is sacred and what is common, between what is ceremonially unclean and what is clean. And you must teach the Israelites all the decrees that the Lord has given them through Moses. You know, the Jewish leaders, they had lost their understanding of God's holiness. 
They could no longer distinguish between the sacred and the common, between what is clean and what is unclean. They couldn't see what they were doing was morally and spiritually wrong. And they couldn't see that Jesus was the Messiah, although they had plenty of evidence to prove he was. You know, as I think about this, and I think about Dr. Seuss being taboo to read now, and all these things, we live in a world today that's lost its moral compass. We no longer can distinguish between what is clean and what is unclean, between the sacred and the common. How far we have fallen as a nation. I get it. I think people should have rights. I, I'm not... I'm not minimizing what people are choosing to do. That's between them and God. But we're trying to be silenced at this point. And, uh, you know, if it continues on, it, it's going to be uh, a difficult time uh, to be the church in this country. Um, I, just, I just don't understand it. So we have definitely lost our moral, com our moral compass. We're not distinguishing between clean and unclean. We, we live in a world that has fallen, and unfortunately so many people are gravitating towards a sinful world and pushing God further and further away. You know, Hebrews 12, 1 through 4, it's a, one of my favorite passages, to be honest with you, and I refer to it quite often. But I really think it's the very prescription that we need today to be able to avoid uh, the things that are happening that are pushing people further and further away from God. The writer says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance this race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And he reminds us, in your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. You know, we who live by faith, we're called to a life of holiness. God is holy, be ye therefore holy. We have the Bible, we have the Word of God who declares what is holy, what is common, what is unholy, what is clean, what is unclean. And God hasn't changed. The world wants to change God to conform to its image, but God hasn't changed. And this was for our benefit, our benefit that we could live in the presence of God and we could live in the holiness of God by keeping our lives pure and free from Abandon, abandoning grace and living in sin, willful sin, without a thought. You know, every day we face challenges and temptations to abandon the faith, to embrace the things of the world. You know, Satan is good at what he does. He's had a long time to perfect it. I used to, to tease, you know, people would say, wow, the bishop's really good at giving his message. I said, well, he gives it every week. And it, it, it gets better, you know, because you have time to perfect it. Well, Satan has had ages to perfect what he does, to pull people further and further away from God. And he's so good at it, they don't even realize what's happening. So we need to understand we're facing these challenges every day, and we need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. We need to stay in the Word of God. If we're not, we're going to wander away. And it doesn't happen all at once. It happens gradually, little by little by little. And before you realize it, you're, you're far, far away from home. John 2, 18 and 21, he says, But the Jewish leaders demanded, What are you doing? They're not having the temple guards arrest him, but what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. You know, they, they've seen Jesus. They've heard Jesus. They've seen the miracles. They've heard the condemnation that Jesus had for them. They don't believe. He'd already shown them many miraculous signs and wonders, but they still lack this faith to believe, even though he is the true Messiah, the living Son of God. And after the resurrection, they still wouldn't believe. 
The disciples would finally get it and go, wow, yes, I remember what he said. He truly is the Messiah. What did they say? They said, well, this is the way it happened. His disciples came in the middle of the night and they stole his body. He's not truly the Messiah. Well, the fact that we're still talking about this 2,000 plus years later is because you can't perpetuate a lie. It's the truth, and the truth stands the test of time. And we're proclaiming Jesus until he returns again, and we'll continue to proclaim and worship him in glory. You know, Jesus had given them everything that they needed, and they would not believe their Eyes were blind, their hearts were hardened, they were filled with sin and greed and corruption. All they cared about was themselves. All right, Jesus replied, destroy this temple and in three days I will rise it up, raise it up. What, they exclaimed, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you can rebuild it in three days. But when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. And even after the resurrection, they still denied it. They saw him. He was here for 40 days after the resurrection. Hundreds of people saw the resurrected Lord. People that saw him put to death, people that saw him die on the cross, knew that he was in the grave, saw him up and walking, and yet they denied it because their evil desires refused to receive Jesus as the Messiah of God. There are many people today that are there. They don't want Jesus to be the Messiah of God. They don't want him. They don't want God. What they want is what this world can offer them. And it's a bill of goods. You know, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples, they remembered. He said this. And they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus said. You know, as we follow this journey, this three-year journey with the disciples and Jesus, you know, we're coming to the culmination where his passion is at hand. But there were times that, that he's saying and doing things, and the disciples have no understanding of what he's doing. Occasionally, they'll take him off to the side and say, hey, Jesus, what did you mean by that? And he would explain it to them. Now, he has been very forthcoming in telling them exactly what's going to happen to him, and they have seen evidence. They have seen him raise the dead, feed the hungry, do miraculous healings. Peter, even in a moment, God the Father revealed the reality of who his son is, and Peter got it, and still they just were slow to understand the things of God. Jesus must have said, boy, you guys are slow. Really? You guys are dim. You know, don't, don't you understand by now? And, and let's not be too hard on these guys because I think if Jesus was here, he'd say, boy, you guys are slow. Boy, you guys are dim. After all this time, don't you get it? You know, so often we too are slow to understand the things of God and this is where faith comes in. This is where we have to remember what God has done for us in the past. This is where we have to hold tight to our faith that God has promised to never leave us nor forsake us. We're going through a difficult time right now. It's a crazy world. Without the... the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, it's a crazy world. It's a sinful, fallen generation. And here's the thing. Writer of Hebrews 11.1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not currently see. Faith. See, I can trust God today even though I can't fully see what he's doing I can trust him because I know what he's done in the past. I know what he's done in my past. I know what he's done in the lives of others. And I know what his holy word has said. Faith. I believe even though I don't see with my eyes, I, I see with my heart. And I know that he's God and he's good and he's gracious and he's working out his plan. 
Furthermore, I don't think we could take it if God gave us all of the pieces at once. But there have been times in my life I think, God, where are you? What are you doing? (laughs) And then I look back a year later or five years later or ten years later and I say, God, you were right there and you were working out your plan for my life. Oh, I had a, have a child I did a lot of praying for. Difficult, difficult moments. Just crying out, God, where are you in all this? Fast forward 15 years. That same child says, you know, all that that you were saying was right. Couldn't see it at the time, and I was really afraid. We can't always understand everything that God is doing in the moment. Sometimes until after it's, it's been done, and, and then he opens our eyes to the reality of what's been going on. But, you know, in faith, I think we need to continue to... Uh, to trust God, but we need to pray for our children and our grandchildren and our family and our church family and our, our neighbors and friends, you know, that, that God would, would touch their lives in powerful ways. You know, I, I pray for the world that we live in, this country and these, some of these leaders in our government that are saying things that just blow my mind. I think God help them. Show them the truth. Fill them with a sense of your holy word and your holiness. So we have a God that's working in our lives each and every day, and we're not always able to see what he's doing until after the fact, but he is working. He's giving us everything we need in Christ Jesus every single day. Paul reminds us in Romans 8.28, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. He he has a purpose and a plan for our lives, but we need to be willing to embrace that plan and that purpose. Rarely does the Lord do things that we understand at the time. You know, I I have agonized over this pandemic. I have agonized over the world that we live in right now, specifically this country, and the choices and things that we're, we're saying are good. And I know that God's word says, no, it's unholy, it's not clean, it is sin, and it's destroying the very fabric of family. And yet I pray, I know, God, you're already in tomorrow. you're, You're working out your plan of redemption for mankind. You know, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, He says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You don't belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. And each of us who profess Jesus as Savior and Lord, we are the body of Christ, the temple of the living Lord. We are to keep our lives clean and pure and holy, lest we become like those who have traded in the truth for a lie. Here's the thing, friends. Every day you need to remind yourself that your heart is the temple of the living God. The things we say, the things we do, the places we go, the things that we allow or don't allow, all have an impact on us, on the temple. Collectively, we are the temple of God. It comes at a very, very high price. You know, this has not been something that happened overnight in the world. This has happened for a long, long time now, probably decades probably longer than even the 60s. I think of Madeline Murray O'Hare who kind of pushed the, the envelope a little bit and won a little wiggle room and little by little we're, we're just seeing things that uh, God calls sin, that God is, is truly uh, 
frustrated with, that God is truly dismayed at the level and depth of sin in the lives of those that want nothing to do with him. You know, Satan's final battle, he wants to destroy the church. His time is limited, and it's not going to win. We, we already know he is not going to prevail, but he's going to take as many people with him as he can. And you know what? If you profess Jesus as your Savior and Lord, he's working overtime on you each and every day. We need to understand what is the sacred, what is the common, what is clean, what is unclean. God is holy. We are to be holy. We do that by keeping our, our, our lives, our hearts and our minds focused on Christ, and on the word of God. Let us pray. Father God, we, uh, we pray that Jesus would indeed uh, clean house. Clean house in this world and in the hearts and lives of those who deny him, but also in the lives of those who proclaim him as their Lord and Savior. We have those hidden areas of life, of greed and lust, a whole multitude of sin that we need to have cleansed and cleaned and removed. Help us, Father. Help us, Father, to fix our eyes on Jesus. We should allow this correction, this cleaning that will help us to be all that you desire for us to be in Christ Jesus. Father, I pray if there is someone hearing this message today that hasn't received Jesus as Savior and Lord, that today would be the day that they would receive life, that they would surrender their will for the will of God, that they would ask Jesus into their heart and life as their Savior and Lord to forgive them for their sins and to be the, the shepherd of their lives, the Savior of their lives. And so, Lord, I pray that that would happen. I pray that we could see that happening in our communities and in our schools and in our marketplaces and in the the families that don't know very little, if anything, about you. I'm often amazed at the children that we, we, we touch in ways today that don't know any of the biblical stories. Oh, Father, help us to, to be a lighthouse of hope for this community and a sanctuary of growth. Help us to stay the course, fixing our eyes on Jesus, even if the road gets rocky. May we know that you're with us and that you're providing every step of the way. So I pray your rich blessing and protection upon Zion Evangelical and the Church Universal, that we could stay the course during a difficult time as we await the return of Jesus as our Savior and King to the renewal of body, mind, and spirit in a glorified body one day, eternity with you. Oh, Father, hear our prayers and hear our pleas for forgiveness for the areas that we have fallen short. Help us to stay the course. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our uh, closing hymn today is Lead Me to Calvary. I 
so happy that you could be a part of our worship service today. I, I know that there's much to be gained as we gather. Uh, there's much to be gained in, in trusting God that he's working in us and through us as a church. You know, it, it truly is a, a war and a battle that we're living in in, in the culture today that we're living in. It doesn't seem to be any end in sight. Uh, just when I think that they can come up with something that I find truly repulsive, uh, they find something else that's even worse. And, and so I, I, I just don't get it. Uh, we need to be uh, on our faces in prayer, and we need to continue to worship God and proclaim him to a hurting world. Amen. Amen. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and goodness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Amen and amen.